Chinese officials meet with U.S. officials in Alaska. It had a rocky start. Well, U.S.-China relations thaw out. Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. The U.S. and China had their first high-level meeting under the Biden administration last Thursday and Friday in Anchorage, Alaska. And the only thing colder than the temperature outside was the temperature in the meeting room. But first, YouTube has been demonetizing us a lot. We need your support on the crowdfunding website Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash America Uncovered for more. So last week, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met their Chinese counterparts. Leading the Chinese delegation were Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and Director of the Central Foreign Affairs Commission Yang Jiechi. And like I said, the meeting started off real cold. A planned four-minute photo shoot ended up lasting one hour and 15 minutes due to a frothy exchange. Both sides kept calling the reporters back into the room just so they could add remarks. And you'll see why in a minute. The opening remarks started with Blinken stating the Biden administration is committed to leading with diplomacy and to strengthening the rules-based international order. He didn't shy away from mentioning Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan, cyber attacks on the U.S. and China's economic coercion. The Biden administration has made it clear human rights abuses aren't going to be dismissed from the dialogue. But the main purpose for the meeting, according to the Biden administration, was to lay out each side's national interests and their disagreements and to talk about where they can work together. But according to National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, they would do it from a position of strength. And here's what Blinken said during the opening remarks of the meeting. Uh, I've said that the United States relationship with China will be competitive where it should be, collaborative where it can be, adversarial where it must be. The Chinese Communist Party didn't see it the same way. In his opening remarks, Yang Jiechi really let it go. Yang claimed that the United States does not have the qualification to say that it wants to speak to China from a position of strength. That's because many people in the U.S. don't have confidence in the democracy of the United States. Unlike in China, where everybody loves the Chinese Communist Party. According to the Chinese Communist Party. That's why to really do things right, the U.S. obviously has to look to the Chinese Communist Party as a role model, according to the Chinese Communist Party. And here's where Yang Jiechi went full wolf warrior. I'll tell you how after the break. Welcome back. In his opening remarks, Chinese Communist Party official Yang Jiechi spoke for over 15 minutes without translation. He was supposed to speak for two minutes. You see, he needed all that time to be able to criticize the U.S. for our human rights problems, like racism and imperialism, while also talking about how great the Chinese Communist Party is. Yang pointed out that unlike the U.S., China doesn't believe in invading or massacring people of other countries. I mean, according to the Chinese Communist Party, why invade or massacre people in other countries when you can just invade and massacre people in your own country, it saves so much time. Yes, according to Yang, the Chinese Communist Party is all about peace, development, fairness, justice, freedom, and democracy. Unlike the U.S., which is all about white supremacy, according to Chinese state-run media. Now, this kind of aggressive, in-your-face attitude from Chinese officials has been called wolf warrior diplomacy named after a series of nationalistic action films. But as I mentioned in an episode of China Uncensored, it should really be called troll face diplomacy. That's because it's all about sucking up attention and getting under your skin. To his credit, Secretary Blinken didn't blink. He called reporters back into the room after Yang's speech so they could hear his rebuttal. Blinken said, sure, the U.S. makes mistakes, but what we've done throughout our history is to confront those challenges openly, publicly, transparently, not trying to ignore them, not trying to pretend they don't exist, 
not trying to sweep them under a rug. And Blinken says this makes us stronger, better, more united as a country. I've talked before about how this is one of America's greatest strengths, especially compared to the Chinese Communist Party, which can never admit they're wrong about anything. But the Communist Party is also great at turning America's strengths into weaknesses. And we should expect to see more attacks from the party about how racist and divided America is. Like this accusation about white supremacy. The real question is whether the Biden administration will buckle under that pressure. The Biden administration did a good job of orchestrating a position of strength ahead of the meeting with Chinese officials. They did that by having Blinken travel to U.S. allies like Japan and South Korea before the meeting and reaffirm those alliances, while also calling out China's coercion and destabilizing behavior. Meanwhile, they held the meeting with Chinese officials not in Beijing or in Washington, D.C., but in Anchorage, Alaska, which was a refueling stop for Blinken on his way back from South Korea, which sends the message to Chinese officials that they might as well stop by because U.S. officials were going to be there anyway. Not exactly rolling out the red carpet. Oh, and the Biden administration also added new sanctions to 24 Chinese officials who had already been previously sanctioned for their roles in the Hong Kong crackdown. The Chinese officials were not happy about that. <laughs> It's unclear whether the Biden administration was prepared for Chinese officials to lash out the way they did. But it shouldn't have been a huge surprise. In the end, Yang Jiechi was performing for a domestic audience. Not the domestic audience that bought t-shirts of his speech. This domestic audience. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has made it clear he believes that China is rising while the West is in decline. So Chinese officials have to show they're standing up against the declining America, while the cameras were rolling. So what happened after the cameras stopped rolling? I'll get to that after the break. Welcome back. So was the entire U.S.-China meetings a waste of time? According to Secretary Blinken, no. He said in the closed-door meetings, the two sides were able to have a very candid conversation on topics where their interests intersect, including Iran, North Korea, Afghanistan, and climate change. We certainly know and knew going in uh, that uh, there are a number of areas where we are fundamentally uh, at odds, uh, including uh, China's actions in Xinjiang uh, with regard to, uh, to Hong Kong, Tibet, uh, increasingly Taiwan. It's no surprise that uh, when we raised those issues, clearly and directly, uh, we got a defensive response. But we were also able to have uh, a very candid uh, conversation. Very candid conversation is diplomats speak for worse than talking to your father-in-law who hates you. But senior U.S. administration officials told reporters as soon as the media had left the room, the two sides immediately got down to business and held substantive and direct talks. Substantive and direct means we talked about a lot and we disagreed about almost everything. But the first session of the meeting ran well beyond the two hours they had originally set. The U.S. also raised the issue of two Canadians, Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig, who were recently put on trial in China without access to diplomats. Aside from all that, well, there were no joint statements nor any announcements. But Chinese officials have tried to cast this week's discussions as the start of a series of talks, a so-called strategic dialogue. The Biden administration has dismissed that, saying it was a one-off gathering. So what's the biggest takeaway from the Anchorage meeting? Well, U.S.-China relations don't seem to be getting better. Former Pentagon official Elbridge Colby tweeted the biggest takeaway of the Anchorage meeting wasn't the debating points. It's China's confidence and assertiveness. They know they're very strong. But that assertiveness may have backfired. Because while it may have played well in Beijing, Yang Jiechi's aggressive lecture made the Chinese side look like the rude bullies. And according to former U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton, that will work against them. 
So when you see the Chinese uh, leadership prepared to make statements like that in public, I think it helps show to the American population, to our friends in Canada and around the world, uh, that those of us who have been saying China constitutes a threat to uh, the U.S. and its allies are not exaggerating. Like I said earlier, the real issue is how the Biden administration will respond next. Will they continue to push hard against the Chinese Communist Party? Or will they back down and try to re-engage with China? Some experts are actively pushing for Biden to stop being so tough on China. Yes, what we really need to do is engage, reduce tensions, maybe give some more money to the Chinese Communist Party. Hey, at least we can work on climate change together. The U.S., after all, needs China, according to the Chinese Communist Party. So what do you think? How will U.S.-China relations play out under the Biden administration? Leave your comments below. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.